<laughs> so welcome to the Nurses Station show. Uh, we are excited to be here today. We're going to talk about some very interesting topics. But before we get to that, we'd like to talk to you about the concept of our show. So the Nurses Station is an idea uh, that kind of centers around coming together, talking about issues that affect us as a profession. Historically, the nurses station was a place where nurses come, they get report, they talk to one another, uh, they talk about their patients, and they talk about a lot of times their personal lives and experiences. So we thought it'd be pretty interesting to talk to you today about some things that affect us as nurses. And so we'll be coming to you every two weeks with a variety of different topics. We hope that you find those interesting. Um, you can follow us on nursing.emory.edu backslash the nurses station. And we also will have a page on LinkedIn, the Nurses Station Show. And so with that being said, uh, I would like to take a moment to allow each one of us to introduce ourselves so you can get to know a little bit more about us. And then we'll kind of get into the meat of the show today. So since I'm talking already, I'll go ahead and start. My name is Dr. Alexis Dunn. I am an assistant professor at the Emory University School of Nursing. I practice clinically as a nurse midwife. And prior to that, I spent about 10 years working as a labor and delivery nurse. And so my research and my uh, clinical practice and uh, teaching that I do centers around maternal child health issues, which we will get into at some point during this season. So uh, I guess now we'll turn it over to Dr. Carolyn Clevenger and then we'll go to some of our other hosts. Thanks, Lexi. Yep, I'm Dr. Okay. Carolyn Clevenger. I'm at the School of Nursing as well at Emory uh, and I'm Associate Dean for Clinical and Community Partnerships. Uh, I am by training a gerontological nurse practitioner, so I've specialized in the care of older adults since about two years out of my basic nursing training. Before I went to uh, graduate school, I was a cardiac step down and a cardiothoracic ICU nurse uh, doing 12 hour night shifts for a couple of years, which I loved and spent a fair amount of time at nurses stations in those days. Uh, now I specialize in dementia care and I direct and see patients in a practice it's called the Integrated Memory Care Clinic, which is a nurse-led model of care that we've created and uh, that we run here at Emory. Thanks. How about Roxana? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Roxana. I'm a nurse scientist and a postdoctoral fellow at the School of Medicine. I'm also um, an immigrant, and I am a first-generation college student, and so I'm really, really happy to be here with all these wonderful uh, colleagues of mine. And last but not least, the Tim Cunningham. Thanks, Lexi. It's, it's such a treat to be able to, to meet up and hang out with you, Roxana, Carolyn, and Lexi to, to talk about things that I'm really, really passionate about. My name's Tim Cunningham, um, and I'm the Vice President of Practice and Innovation at Emory Healthcare. I also have an adjunct assistant professorship at the Emory uh, School of Nursing here. Um, got a lot of letters behind my title, and I'm still trying to figure out what they are myself. Uh, <laughs> this current role in which I sit is probably my third career. Um, my first career was as a professional actor. I did musicals, theater, and I got involved with clowning. Yeah, it's true. Um, clowning? I was a clown. I still am a clown, but I know that scares people. I knew, I knew there was something <laughs> special. I, we, I knew we it. Talk about this till like episode three, because we're going to scare people off. I'm not a scary clown, people. I'm not going to do anything clowning unless requested. Um, no, I worked. <laughs> it will be requested. But I, I worked at the Big Apple for the Big Apple Circus Clown Care Program back in the day at Boston Children's Hospital. My name was Dr. Bumble, um, and I wore that was my first white coat. And I like roller skated through the hospital with my colleagues. I impersonated IV poles, and our mission was to connect with patients and families and and change the energy of the space. And it's that work that inspired me to become a nurse because we've been working in the PICU with kids who are literally on their deathbed. They would sit up and smile and play with us. And then caregivers in the room, moms, dads, aunts, uncles would look and say, we haven't seen our kids smile since we got here to the hospital. So I was like, that's powerful stuff. So I got interested and I also noticed that it wasn't just the clowns with that level of connectivity, but it was the nurses. And I was blown away at the ability of nurses to connect with people in states of the most extreme suffering. So I went back to school, studied nursing, became an emergency nurse. I've worked in a few level one trauma centers, both for adult and pediatric emergency, um, and have done some humanitarian global health work, which we're going to talk about later in the season. Uh, got my doctorate in public health. And I'm curious about, like, how do we connect? 
How do we stay resilient? How do we provide care that's quality on the human level? And uh, so that's the research that I've been doing. Um, I, I, I love working clinically, but right now my job is not clinical. I'm in a nurse administrative position where I am honored to work with 7,000 plus nurses here at Emory, trying to figure out how we can make this the best workplace for our nurses and teams so that we can give the most compassionate care possible. Um, awesome to be with you. Tim, that was beautiful. I mean, I literally want to cry right now. Like, I feel like okay, I need to go really? back. I need to go back and, and channel and get my, can I call you Dr. Bumble? <laughs> yeah, you call me Dr. Bumble, please. Call me Dr. I, mean, I know you're Dr. Cunningham, but Dr. Bumble so fits. <laughs> <laughs> so doctor so confusing. We're probably going to talk about that later. Like, doctor, nurse, you're a nurse and a doctor, what? So, yeah, Dr. Bumble, maybe later in the season, I'll wear my Heelys and roller skate around my... Uh, I would my, love it. I think it would go <laughs> nicely. <laughs> So that was great. I think, you know, let's just kind of jump into it. So I think a lot of people um, know what nurses are, but there is a lot of confusion. And so I didn't know if we should kind of jump in and tell and talk about what is a real nurse. I mean, Carolyn, what, what has been your experience as a nurse? Well, you know, so good and bad, right? There are so many of us. And it's unusual, I think, for people not to have somebody who's a nurse in their family or in their faith community or in the neighborhood, that sort of thing. And um, I, I think it cuts a couple of different ways. We think about nurses for what nurses do. So when, you know, and I, and right now I have friends, um, my own kids and my friends' kids who are going into college and thinking about career paths for themselves. And so they're also um, interested in nursing as it turns out. And, you know, like, what, what does that look like? And, and when they think about it, like it, it's so attached to, nurses do these things and then we define this profession and career by tasks which is unfortunate because it really kind of boils it down to um, not necessarily what it means to be a nurse you know a nurse is it's not necessarily what they do um, I, I do work with a lot of older people professionally and um, I think if we only think about nurses as what they do, I have plenty of retired nurses in my practice. Maybe they're caregivers for a spouse or for someone else. Uh, maybe they are the, my patients. And um, to, to say that they were a nurse or they used to be a nurse, what an insult. I mean, you will get corrected pretty quickly because they continue to be, they are a nurse. That's how they identify. I mean, going through nursing school is really life-changing. It changes the whole lens through which you view the rest of the world. I think about housing from a nursing perspective, right? I think about um, policing from a nursing perspective and what that means for people and all of those nuances because we get that really unique insight into people's lives. So, um, you know, a real nurse is just so vast and that's kind of the cool thing about the profession. For those college age kids in my network, when I think about what it means to be a nurse, like what an amazing place to begin because there are a million ways you can go from there. And um, so insulting to consider somebody not a real nurse because they may be in an administrative role um, or not in, you know, uh, doing direct patient care because you may not be in direct patient care and have influence over thousands of people's lives. For example, if you're the senior nurse in a corporate healthcare environment, as one of my friends is for the whole US, she probably has a lot of influence over what those Medicare beneficiaries receive in their long-term services. And she's not in direct patient care and has actually been said, it's been said to her, she's not really a nurse practitioner in her case. So, um, yeah. you know, what a, what a shame. It's, it's, it's hard. I mean, uh, Roxanne, I don't know if you want to share kind of things that you've gone through um, in the real nurse conversation. I know for me, you know, as a midwife, well, we'll get to that. We'll let Roxanne, just you chime <laughs> in and let us know <laughs> how your experience has been. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I didn't go uh, to school to become a nurse until I was uh, 28. And I did that because um, a pediatrician told me I could be a nurse. And I was just like, oh, like, what? I can be a nurse? And so when I went to nursing school, uh, my goal was just to be, um, to be a charge nurse. I didn't know that there were all of these other careers in nursing um, that you could tap into until I was introduced to it by, um, at, you know, at Emory by seeing like all of these different nurses from like the CDC, as well public health and you know, administrators, uh, 
coming to introduce what it is that they do and how it is that they're able to help like, you know, these large populations um, with the work they do. And so I think that that's something we could do, probably do better at. And I think that the show is doing that, showcasing like all the different ways that nurses impact health, the communities, and how we're all in it together from like the bedside nurse, you know, all the way to the researcher or that's doing, you know, COVID-19 research, you know, to, you know, uh, Tim doing administrative uh, stuff at, at Emory Healthcare and, and keeping like the nurse flow going and making sure that we preserve health. It can be yeah. overwhelming to think about like the, the breadth of it all and the spectrum and, the, and, the, and like the possibility. Um, and exciting too. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. And I think a lot of people don't really, and maybe we could talk more about that breadth. I know we're kind of throwing it around. Uh, but for me personally, how I got into nursing, I actually started off as a pre-med major. I always knew that I wanted to deliver babies and be in maternal child health. And I had to take this medical ethics class. And in the class, we read a book that had a lot of nursing stories in it. And Tim, just like you described, the way the nurses were talking about their interactions with the patients, I'm like, this fits more of who I am as far as like the holistic approach, looking at the entire family, how the entire family and the community shapes health. And I felt like nurses kind of sit at the intersection of that. They're trying to bring it all together. And so that's when I changed my major. And then later on, I discovered that there were nurses that delivered babies. I never put midwifery and nursing together. Um, and I know that's a, another concept that, that came along later on. You know, we've always had midwives traditionally, but then that's how I kind of got into nurse midwifery and advanced practice nursing. So um, once I did that, I started seeing things in my practice and I couldn't quite I would go to the literature to try to see, like, why are so many women having preeclampsia or why are so many women, uh, black women having preterm births? And when I would go to the literature, there would be holes in the literature. And I'm like, well, how do you answer those questions? And then that's when someone was like, well, you have to do research. And I was like, <laughs> I'm never doing that. Like, never in a million years would I ever do research. <clears throat> but then after, <laughs> you never should say never, right? I think that's the key to opening the door to doing stuff. But when I realized that research is simply learning how to systematically answer a question and that if you're answering questions that you really care about, then I care about the statistics and what those statistics mean and how people understand those statistics. And so that's how I got into doing research. And so I guess I love what I do now. I'm still a clinician at heart. And I think as long as we're answering those questions and uh, sharing that information in a way that people can understand, then I would feel like I'm doing my job. Yeah, totally. Lexi, I mean, I like, just like you saying, I would never imagine I do research. I never imagined I'd have a job where I'd have to wear a tie. At least I can choose between a necktie and a bow tie. Um, <laughs> but I totally feel the same because I went into nursing because I wanted to care for people and do clinical and patient care. But I learned for me, nursing is all about the mentors that we encounter. Mm -hmm. And one of my most influential mentors was a nurse midwife, still is a nurse midwife. He's a male nurse midwife. And, and for those in the podcast, to be clear, I'm a white cisgendered male. I, I identify as male. My pronouns are he, him. And so I think there are aspects of my nursing experience that have been a little bit different and quite jaded in some ways that I, I'd love to touch on. But like he was a male nurse mid, midwife in a hospital that had no other male nurse midwives. And what he taught me about connections with the moms and the families coming from his point of view and his maleness um, I realized the opportunities within nursing and how broad they can be. And I tip my hat to all nurse midwives because what you all do, like literally I would pass out and I nearly passed out every day. <laughs> I was like, this is, this you is, would a, be, you this wouldn't. Is handle. <laughs> well, I wouldn't pass out in front of them. I would, I would crawl away into another room and just talk. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's so broad. And, you know, and another one of my mentors that really, I think about all the time, his name is Nurse BB. He was one of the clowns I worked with in Boston and he was a nurse clown, Nurse BB. And he would always leave the room when we'd interact with patients and he'd say, hey guys, thanks for letting us perform with you. Um, if you need anything, if you wanna you know, need anything, ask your doctor. If you wanna know what's going on, ask your doctor. If you really wanna know what's going on, ask a nurse. Yeah. <laughs> and we would always get a laugh as clowns because it's truth, right? We laugh. It's, it's true. It's I true. mean, how many times have y'all gone in a room and the doctor and you're standing right there with them and then as soon as the provider goes out, they're like, okay, so what did he say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> big picture. We're big picture people. Yeah. Well, I think there's this um, connection to the humanness and sort of doing that translation, right? So we have all of these medical terminology, 
um, expertise, which we're going to be trying not to use on this uh, nurses station show, but it may pop up. But we also can translate that to um, what people sort of want to know. And I think we pay close attention to those things about what matters most to the person, what they were listening for. So if they heard a five minute explanation of this is the diagnosis that we've we're zeroing in on and here's the plan, but we've kind of got the other background because we've been making that connection. It's such a powerful thing, that connection with people um, that we can maybe do the translation for them. And, I, you know, we're, I think, glad and feel privileged to have the opportunity to do that. Yeah. I mean, crazy to think about, but as nurses, we are there at the beginning and the end. As nurse midwives, we are there at the beginning of like the birth of these incredible human beings and nurses across the, and especially now with COVID, we are there at the endings. We're the ones holding the iPhone so families can still connect with their patients even though they can't come in. We're the ones who, I mean, I, I think of a couple of deaths that I've experienced in which I've held the hand or literally I was asked at one point to hold the heart, put my hand over the heart of a person as it stopped beating to honor the end of their life. So as nurses wow. were there, beginning, ending, everywhere in between. And as nurse researchers, we're the ones who are helping lead the decisions on how best to make this life cycle right and equitable and kind and compassionate for people. Mm -hmm. um, totally agree. Roxanne, mm -hmm. you have any thoughts? Um, I, ju I just think that um, uh, Tim touched on something that I believe a lot and that's uh, mentors. And I think mentors are huge, uh, make a huge impact on nurses, but I think being also um, open to, uh, to other uh, people who are not nurses and them like teaching you also different ways. And that, I think that makes you a much better advocate and, and you're able to translate things and understand things uh, and, and help the patients with their decision-making. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally agree, totally agree. I want to pitch a question to you guys. I know we're kind of talking about our experiences and kind of, and we'll be able to share more throughout the season as far as different things we've experienced. But I think we should maybe shift a little and let's talk a little bit about some of the confusion, I think there's a lot of confusion. Um, you know, nurses sometimes get lumped into categories and they may or may not actually be nurses. So I want to talk about that. And then I also thought we should maybe talk a little bit about some of the other issues facing nursing, burnout, you know, mental health things. And so uh, Tim and Carolyn, I feel like both of you are in a position where you have to kind of oversee a lot of different people, students, uh, nurses. And so I don't know if you guys want to kind of share with us what your experiences have been with that. So um, when I, so I should say I'm uh, from West Virginia. That's where I grew up. That's where I did my basic training and my first couple of years nursing. And in that space, um, nurses commanded a lot of respect because um, there was a, there is still among Appalachian culture, a fair amount of distrust uh, from the medical community. And um, so when I was in school, people would say, so you're in school, what are you going to do? I'm in nursing school. Like, are you going to be a registered nurse? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> so, you know, it was just so like, they were so like excited for me and, oh, what a wonderful thing. What a, you know, just all of that trust that we hear about every year on big surveys, but, you know, focused right there. And when I then um, decided to go that next step and become a nurse practitioner uh, for a variety of reasons, including I really wanted to focus on older adults exclusively. That's really where my heart has always been and, and where I wanted to be. And so then to talk about being a nurse practitioner, pe sometimes people would say, so do you think you might um, go on to become a registered nurse? So th there, we have a lot of terminology around nurse. Mm -hmm. you know, we have nurse technicians, certified nursing aides or assistants, licensed practical nurses, vocational nurses, you know, and then of course nurse practitioner too. And um, kind of all of that gets lumped together in one big category of nurse. So I, you know, I, I know part of it is it's our professional lingo. So it's hard for people to understand outside of the profession, um, but it does create some confusion. And then there's some explaining that you need to do. And in the world of um, geriatrics and uh, long-term services and supports, most of the time uh, staff are not necessarily registered nurses. That's a really expensive resource, and they're not as plentiful as we would like. And, and the total care of patients requires a lot of different levels of staff. And so many times in that world, everyone who is being an assistant, who is helping, 
who's probably providing direct care uh, gets lumped under that title of nurse, which is a little challenging because then, you know, I think for consumers, for families mm -hmm. and for patients, it's hard to know what should I expect from this person who's coming in and, and how can I um, best leverage this resource that's in front of me. You know, on the yeah. other side, though, that that nurse practitioner piece, which I do feel like is better understood now than when I came out of school, you know, almost 20 years ago at this point. But for nurse practitioners, still a major source of their burnout at work and stress at work is that there we are in a little bit of a, a no man's land, you know, so mm -hmm. you don't exactly get identified with nurses. And sometimes nurses will say things like, I just wish nurse practitioners would remember you're still a nurse. I don't think any nurse practitioner ever forgets that they're a nurse. There's a reason they chose that pathway versus other ways to be that independent practitioner. So there's that. And then we're not also necessarily part of the physician club, right? So, or, right. and sometimes people are inclusive for the providers, but many times you're just sort of in uh, limbo between these two universes and you don't really have a home where you belong unless you happen yeah. to be really fortunate to be at a place like Emory Healthcare, where there are hundreds, uh, almost a thousand, I think at this point, advanced practice providers. So you do have a peer group where you can kind of have that home base, but it's a, uh, it's a real challenge to kind of be in that space and you can see it in their stress and anxiety that's driven by work. It's like an identity crisis, isn't it? It girl? is. I mean, yeah. and, and I think about as, as when I started working as a nurse, I would often walk into the rooms and you, you develop rapport with the families that you're working with. And so many times I would be asked, so when are you going to become a doctor? When are you going to go to medical school? Other identity crisis, I would walk into a room if I was the only male in the room and the physicians in the room were female, people would keep looking at me and say, oh, doctor, what about this? And I would say, I would look at the physician. This is your physician. I'm Tim. I'm your nurse. That's a great question for your physician. And in some places where I work, they keep going back to me. And it's like, they're, they're cultural shifts that we need to make as a country about nursing. And also when you're treating people in the hospital, they're scared, they're stressed. So they might be reverting back to the only thing they know and not seeing through it. And I've been called ma'am a million times. And, and I, don't, like, I don't think I look very female, especially being bald and things like that. But I think there's this mindset, nurse is this. And yeah. something that we're changing is nurse is this, that, and the other, but then how do we remain clear? Cause also our patients need us. So how do we, how do they know who we are and what we're going to do and how do we communicate that? And, and I'm getting stressed Roxanne and thinking about the identity crisis of what is it like to be a nurse scientist working at a school of medicine doing research when I've been on planes with people, I've introduced people, I'd say, I'm a nurse, I do some research and they're like, Nurses do research. Oh yeah, that's yeah. a oh, yeah. <laughs> You know what I'm thinking is that uh, there is no word to uh, translate nurse practitioner in Spanish. Oh wow. Oh. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So uh, it's there's it's not it's not a concept. Yeah, it's really. not a concept. So. So in that in that translation, so there's nurse and physician. So there's no. There's no word for it. There's no terminology to describe a nurse practitioner in oh, Spanish. That's interesting. I never that I've never even considered that. When we think about all the different types and groups of people we take care of, yeah, that they just may not fully understand what you do because the word doesn't exist. Exactly. Wow. Mm -hmm. And if we propose one or come up with a way to sort of describe it, let's make sure we leave the word mid level out of that. Oh, right. uh, Please don't get me started <laughs> yes. on that. <laughs> I won't go too far down that path. Sorry. <laughs> don't go down that path. Please don't. <laughs> well, Lexi, too, we've got nurses and nurse midwives. 2020 is the year of the nurse and the nurse yes. midwife as designated by the WHO. And I kind Absolutely. of scratched my head on that, too, because, like, I always thought all midwives are nurses. But do we have midwives? No. 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 No, it's not. And so, I mean, that's a, a, that's a whole can of worms, Tim. I would need a whole episode to really unpack <laughs> Let's the, the whole midwifery conversation. Um, midwifery has been around since ancient times. I mean, it's a profession in and of itself. And I think in America, there was this period of time where, um, not to get too political with it, but there was this erasure of what midwifery represented. It was something that was housed within the African-American community. It was something that, um, you know, wasn't looked at as like a real profession for a period of time until someone decided that it should be a real profession. And then there was this kind of, you know, educational standards put on it and different things. And that's not to say that that's not needed. 
But what it did was effectively kind of isolate the original group that that profession was a part of. Um, and it was married to nursing. Um, and I appreciate having both the training as a nurse and a midwife, but midwifery can stand alone as its own profession. And so I think there is a ton of confusion when people, when I tell people I'm a nurse midwife, they was like, so you deliver babies at home, which some midwives do <laughs> deliver at home, but they don't have the concept that midwives can deliver babies at home. They, they also work alongside um, physicians, nurse practitioners, and in medical settings and hospitals, and also in birth centers. So we have a variety of different places that we practice in. And so when I decided to go back and get a doctorate, we can kind of segue into the whole doctor nurse conversation because all of us have a variety of doctors and maybe we can talk about the different kind we have. But when I was trying to decide which doctorate I was going to get, which I know one is more clinically focused, which we'll talk about, and one's more research focused, I knew I wanted to do research, but part of the conversation was also, I did not want another ambiguous degree because I think the right. DMP was new, right? It's not a new concept in other fields, but the DMP was a relatively new concept. And I was like, really, am I really going to sit here and have to explain what a nurse midwife is <laughs> and then have a conversation about what my DMP means? Not to say that that was the only reason, but I was like, you know what, PhD, if you say it, he will know exactly what it what it means. Uh, so I'm going to interrupt for a second and I'm going to call you out on something, Lexi. But I do want to frame it that in calling you out, I'm also calling. Okay, let's go, Tim. Out. All right. <laughs> you just said DNP. Now, I know we've got a big nursing. Oh, audience. seriously? Are so, we so going to do this? We're going to do this right now. <laughs> and we're going to go and we're going to start a game for the rest okay. of this season. We're going to have a game and we're going to call it. I don't know what we'll call, we'll call the acronym game, acronym game. When someone uses an acronym. Mm -hmm. that is not in common terminology, mm -hmm. all that person has mm -hmm. to give each of us a dollar. What? And we're going to keep count. And at the Wait end minute. of the Hold season- Hold on, so $3 yeah, dollars I, I have to keep, I have to yeah. give for my- yeah. for, I don't even have a yeah. DNP. You don't have a DNP? Well, do you have Venmo? No, <laughs> I, I don't have a DNP. You got well, to ding me for an acronym. I'm going to ding you for something. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, what about your WHO oh. thing? Oh. You said WHO, does that mean who? I mean, who, who, who cares really? Let's, let's be honest. I mean, they're losing their funding. They're, I mean, the U.S. Okay. All right. That's fair. I said, <laughs> I said earlier. Okay. Like so I owe $3. You owe $3. I owe $3. Hopefully people recording this. Let's, let's back up. Should it be like, shouldn't it be like $1 per acronym versus like per dollar? But you have yeah. a doctor in nursing, which means you get paid gobs of money. Like, oh, really? Let's, talk, <laughs> let's, let's segue into that conversation. Oh, no. <laughs> Another kind of word. <laughs> okay, so maybe $1 okay, per incident that we put in the middle. And then, okay. then we put it at the end. So, okay, so I'm going to keep a tab then. All right. You keep I'll tab. be watching you very closely, though. Roxana, would you keep up with the tab to make sure that Lexi doesn't cheat? Because she, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just, I got a feeling. Okay, so sure. is, this, is this chart going to cover our bar tab at the end of the season? Because I, I need to know. I, I'm asking. You know, that's a real, I think so. That sounds yeah. good. I'm okay. top shelf, though. So we're going to, I mean. Be generous. Yeah. And yeah. we should be able to bring it to the nurse's station because, you know, <laughs> that's what nurses <laughs> do at the do nurses. There. <laughs> so here or not, at the nurses. After work. are we good with this game? So if someone says okay. an acronym, someone else calls them out. And then we explain. So I said, I, I messed up first. I said, who? You sure did. Who? So since you messed up, that's why I messed up. So technically, yeah, exactly. you should pay $2. Well, I'm glad that I could inspire you. And no, I'm not going to pay $2. But uh, what does DMP <laughs> stand for again? The Doctorate of Nursing Practice. Carolyn, right. do you want to talk about what yes, the Doctorate of Nursing Practice is? Yeah, let I'm me paying talk for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and it was a kind of a new thing. Uh, you know, I did mine in 2006. Uh, so really um, early, not the earliest by any stretch. There were not a lot of graduates, though, back then. And um, yeah, it took a minute to figure out how to explain what that is, not just explaining the acronym, but also what that means and how you might use that kind of doctorate. And then the persistent question is, well, how is that different than a PhD and or some of the other doctorates that are out there? So, you know, for me, um, I also said I would never do a doctorate. Um, but I was at graduation and I saw the hats and I was like, <laughs> are you serious? I'm not kidding. I was like, how, how do I get that hat? <laughs> and turns out. Oh, and that, and the, uh, the dry, uh, thing. I didn't What's care it? about the, the big, uh, I don't know. The, they're not even a. Oh, stuff. wait, Tim is running oh, off oh, the screen. What's happening Hold here? on one second. What? I don't know. <laughs> does he have his, does he have his regalia at his place? I bet he has his regalia. He ran way too fast. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Oh, he's going to put the hat on. 
Which, by the way, doesn't work well for someone who wears their hair natural, might I add. We might need to discuss regalia. I mean, I, I didn't say it's flattering. Okay. I just oh. I just like it better than the mortar board. Check it out. Here it comes. Professor, T- Professor Tim. You look so official. Yeah. There it is. There cool. it is. These are cool. You know, you should put a red nose on with that to just bring together all of your professional training. I will do that on the next episode because I said no clowning on this episode. He did commit. I will, I will do that. did commit. But I'll take that for the next time around. Uh, so um, here's what happened. I am in practice. I see these things that are just systematically missing the mark so far, right? And I was actually a research assistant for someone who's still a great friend. Uh, while she was in her PhD, she got some funding. We um, implemented some practice changes uh, in three nursing homes and had three control nursing homes. And I was the data collector. So I'd go into these skilled nursing facilities with my little box and review charts and collect data on their adherence to the protocol. And when we finished the study, and it was around fall risk assessment and fall prevention, a major topic in that world. And when we finished the study, everyone fully understood and expected that that intervention was going to stop, that they would not continue it past that study period. And I thought, well, this is crazy because fall risk and fall prevention is a and critically important topic in this space. And we're doing this for the purposes of the study, but they need to change their practice. We need to change practice long-term. Now, of course, the purpose of her study was to test the intervention to say it was effective in the first place. That was the purpose. And I felt like I really wanted to then take those interventions that had been demonstrated as effective, and I wanted to put them in place in practice for perpetuity and quickly. So I wanted to change practice and see a difference in at least adherence, if not patient outcomes, next week, next month. And I expected that if I managed that change well, we would sustain it for the next year and years beyond so that patients would see that change. So being able to change practice systematically is really where my heart was and is. And that's what I did with the doctor of nursing practice. But explaining that quickly is really tough. In fact, I often say I hate when people say, you know, just casually, oh, what do you do? I'm like, oh, this, it's, it's long. I hate to get into it. Um, and I'm very happy to say I'm a nurse. But it's good. We need to put it out there because it's it's I feel like other professions have their clinical level doctorate. And when it comes to nursing, it's like people can't wrap their head around that we can be doctorally prepared as clinicians. So mm-hmm. I think that it's good for us to kind of um, explain it clearly. So thanks for that story. Hopefully that'll help. Everyone to better. You know, I would say around that time, um, the DNP was, we were increasing graduates, programs were growing. And that was around the time there was so much conversation in the American Medical Association around title protection of doctor. It seemed to really strike a nerve, even though all our health professions colleagues in physical therapy and pharmacy and so on yeah. also have clinical doctorates, but it really seemed to be a sensitive topic then. So what a great time to graduate and call yourself Dr. Clevenger. I know that was, I'm sure that was spicy, spicy, hard, hard to accept at yeah. the time. Roxana, um, maybe we can kind of talk a little bit about PhD. I mean, that's the other option that nurses have uh, as far as doctorates. You want to kind of talk about that? Yeah. So uh, when I was at the community college, uh, getting a, uh, my associate's degree in nursing. Um, Emory University actually came into Georgia Perimeter College to announce this program for uh, minorities to learn about research. And, the, you know, there was a PhD in nursing. And again, my brain was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what I love that. That's good. Yeah, I'm like, what, what is this? I, you know, because I, 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 all I saw was like, I thought charge nurse was it. Like that was like the ultimate goal. Um, and it is for some people, right? But I didn't know that there was these other things out there. And so um, what I find so like interesting is that, you know, my parents have like sixth grade education, they're uh, immigrants. So, you know, they understand nurse. But when I said, you know, that I was going to go to school to get a PhD, they still struggle with that because, um, and especially now that I've graduated and now I'm Dr. Chicas. So my mom is like, so, but you don't give medicine. And I'm like, no. And uh, so now what I do is I, I've tried to explain to them that I'm a nurse scientist and scientists are called Dr. So-and-so. And they still don't really understand that. But so this um, summer, because of COVID, I went and bought a, uh, um, is it over the ground pool or uh-huh. um, 
because I, I figured that pools were going to be closed because of COVID and my kids wanted to, you know, swim. And so I bought one of those cheap ones over the ground. And my, my stepdad was watching me like balance the pool with like chemicals and stuff, you know, you got to get the PhD, right? And, um, and, then he, and then he tells me, ah, oh, now I see you really are a scientist. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm like mixing all you're doing stuff with, it, like a- <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with all these chemicals. So uh, it's still really hard for them to understand. I think slowly like they're, they're getting it that I'm doing like, for example, right now I'm in Florida doing a data collection for our study with agricultural workers where we're looking to see, you know, you know uh, how the kidneys kind of, the kidney function progresses over a harvest period in agricultural workers who are outside in the heat. Um, mm-hmm. So it's really interesting and fun and, and a learning experience for both me and my family and my community. So, yeah. Roxanne, I don't know if this has been your experience, but in mine, when you say, oh, I'm going to pursue this other degree, I'm going to go on to do a higher level of education. Do, do people ask you, I've been asked this, so you're doing that because you're going to make more money. Is that why you, because that, that's sort of like, that's the only reason you would continue going to school is because you're going to make so much more money, uh, you know, to our previous conversation about our, uh, you know, how wealthy doctor nurses are. You keep bringing that money thing up. I'm like, oh, you, yeah. you're just chomping at like yeah. a can of worms. No, um, <laughs> no, I've, I've never been asked that. Um, no. Yep. And I, I don't think like the, just the concept of a uh, PhD in nursing is already like their brain is just can't take it. <laughs> mm-hmm. They haven't processed it very well yet. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm, I want to say something back to the acronym because technically you see how we, we ran with the PhD thing because everybody knows what that is. We should say it's a doctorate of philosophy. So do, does someone get dinged for that? Oh, or is no. that just, is PhD a word you see? That's a, that's a good question. Should we, can we do a poll? Is it can most like well known? You know, once. Yeah. I don't, I think that was you also. I'm not sure. I'd be Wait, well. hold on, Carolyn. But I'm advocating that the PhD is like the NBA. Like, I don't have to say National Basketball Association because you already know what it is. So I'm just trying to, see, I was trying to be honest in bringing that up. Yeah. That's fair. Well, it's universally known. I mean, that was your point. Mm-hmm. Universally known, maybe in, in, in the U.S., maybe? No. I mean, because like, know. My, I have a friend who has a D fill. Who his hat's totally different from this one, but he's got like a deep fill. <laughs> and Tim just saw, tossed his hat out the frame. If you're listening, it's just a hat. Oh just a hat. It's just a hat. Okay, guys. I think we have. You know, we will probably have to come back and visit this topic. You know, I know we don't want to just keep going with it, but I think um, it's been a great conversation to get today. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I look forward to us talking more. Um, thanks to those who are watching or listening today. Uh, just to follow up, we will be coming to you every two weeks with different topics. We'll come next time. I believe we'll be talking about COVID. Is that what our next topic? I think is? so. Yeah. Um, and COVID mm-hmm. is pretty, you know, we have to try to unpack that one. I think going forward, we may have to kind of do a COVID minute with each, with, each, with each episode. But with this next one, we'll kind of just talk about COVID, its impact on the nursing profession, and kind of how we as um, providers and researchers and scholars are facing that challenge. So we welcome any feedback and questions. Again, you can follow us at nursing.emory.edu slash the nurses station or you can find us on LinkedIn or you can look up the nurses station show and follow us there. We'll have our notes and statistics and different things if you want more information about some of the things we've talked about about the nursing profession. So take care. Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks y'all.